Okay, let's get started. So hello everyone and thanks again for joining RPRA and BDO Canada this morning or sorry this afternoon for our webinar where we'll be reviewing the draft batteries resource recovery performance audit procedure uh, and looking for your feedback. My name is Michelle Hoover and I am one of the communications advisors at RPRA and will be your moderator for today's webinar. Next slide please. So we will be asking consultation questions throughout the webinar to gain feedback on what we are proposing in the procedure. Uh, if you have a question for us, please click on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, type in your question and click send. There's also an upvote feature that allows you to bump up someone else's question to the top of our queue. And this is helpful if you want to ask the same question or are interested in hearing the answer. If you are experiencing any technical issues, please let us know by using the chat function and we will do our best to support you. We have also enabled the live transcript feature that transcribes speech to text on your screen. And this webinar is being recorded and will be added to our website along with the presentation slides so you can go back and reference it. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Ellen White, our manager of compliance and strategy. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you to all of you for joining us today. Uh, as Michelle uh, mentioned, we're here to uh, review a draft procedure that was developed by BDO Canada uh, for the Resource Recovery Performance Audit for batteries specifically today. Uh, if you're interested, tomorrow and um, Thursday, we will be doing uh, separate webinars for uh, the other two programs, so we'll be doing a uh, Electronics, so that's um, information technology, technological and audiovisual equipment, um, as well as lighting. That's tomorrow. And then uh, Thursday is going to be our hazardous and special products procedure. Uh, these procedures, they will be referenced uh, for producers when they're reporting on their own activities or pros uh, reporting on their producer clients. Uh, our hope is that we're going to have these posted for the 2024 reporting period. Uh, we have received feedback about the uh, concerns about the short timeline between when these procedures will be final and when that reporting uh, deadline is. Uh, so we're aware of the short timeline. We wanna make sure that these, these uh, reports are posted and finalized and available for you to use in your 2024 reporting. Um, but we are open to feedback around uh, any challenges you feel you might face around meeting that deadline, uh, given that these procedures provide more detail than the uh, existing performance audit procedures on our website. So just wanted to let you all know that we're aware of that concern and we welcome uh, your feedback about that during this consultation. Um, this consultation and a BDO will go into specifics about the timeline for developing this procedure, but uh, we did have a phase one of this consultation between March and April of this year. Uh, during that time, we, we did send out invitations to those uh, who would be impacted by this procedure. So our registered uh, pros and, and processors in these programs. And we did invite, uh, invite you to meet with uh, BDO and us and share your, your thoughts on this procedure. We recognize that not everyone impacted uh, by these procedures were able to attend those sessions. And so in phase two, we're very much interested in hearing feedback from uh, whether you participated in phase one or not, getting your feedback on what's being presented today. This is very much a draft and we very much need your feedback in order to uh, finalize these procedures. So uh, please feel free to uh, follow the directions from Michelle and ask questions during today's session. Uh, but you are also invited to provide written feedback to us uh, between now and December 14th. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Peter from BDO to take us through the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Alan. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. So for those who I wasn't able to speak to in, in phase one of the consultation, uh, my name's Peter Hearn. I'm a senior manager uh, within BDO's risk advisory team in Toronto. Um, and uh, I have been uh, working on this for 
past eight months and uh, uh, happy to walk you through um, the draft procedures that we've made and uh, uh, ask you some questions that we'd like some feedback on. So I will briefly go through the consultation timeline as Ellen mentioned, and then um, lay out some of the feedback that we received during phase one. Um, then we will go through the draft procedure, which has been able to be reviewed on our PRA's website, section by section. And then lastly, we'll uh, explain how to provide uh, that written feedback Ellen just mentioned. Um, so we initially started off with uh, research prior to uh, March 7th, uh, when phase one consultation started. So we were reviewing relevant material that had already been provided to RPRA, for example, um, RER reports, um, as well as the, the relevant regulation um, and looking for where other jurisdictions had perhaps um, performed similar types of audits or similar types of processes so we can understand what was being done elsewhere. Um, then we proceeded with the consultation. Uh, as Alan said, there were group sessions and one-on-one -on -one sessions where we received lots of feedback from processors, pros and producers. Uh, and then the following several months was uh, the process of developing the procedures, um, iterative process where we provided feedback by our PRA uh, and then made sort of changes as, as we went with that. Uh, and now we're into phase two of the consultation. So as we get the feedback from this consultation, we will then work on finalizing procedures. Um, we will prepare a consultation report which summarizes the feed that we received, um, the decisions we made based on that feedback, and then the final outcomes, um, taking into account that um, some of the feedback we, we received can't be taken into account either because of just the, the limitations based on the regulation, the limitations within the auditing standards that we're following, or um, just uh, unable to make something specific to uh, a specific processes or producers needs. Um, and then finally, we will post the procedures and consultation report on our PRA's website, and um, the audit will be performed in 2024, um, possibly in line with uh, the original audit deadline. Um, but obviously, as Adam said, feedback will be considered. Okay, so next slide, please. So the primary feedback that we received um, that was relevant specifically for um, the performance audit, which we are talking about now. Um, so in many cases, uh, we were told it would be difficult for a processor uh, or, a, or, a, or a pro or a producer um, acting alone to get the cooperation of downstream processes uh, in order for them to provide sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. Um, we were also told that if this is the case, um, the, the primary processes shouldn't be penalized for the downstream processes performance. Um, Process ops obviously can operate in, in several different ways, um, which means that a one size fits all procedure won't necessarily work. Um, of course, we want to balance the administrative burden uh, and financial burden of um, these audits with uh, results that work for our PRA and, and other stakeholders and, and, and the public is large. And then lastly, um, we were asked to try and consider align, the alignment of the RER procedure, which um, Dylan uh, has drafted and had consultation on uh, a couple of weeks ago, and this resource recovery performance audit procedure. So as we go through, um, I'll try and mention where we've taken these this feedback into account. Um, but as I say, some of it um, unable to take into account based on the requirements, of the regulations, and, and the requirements of the audit standards. Okay, so um, the draft procedures have been broken out into these sections. So there is the, the purpose of the audit procedure, the reporting criteria, which is defined in the regulation, um, some specific definitions that we, uh, we included that weren't, aren't in the regulation, but we thought were relevant to define for the purposes of these procedures. And um, this is also a case where we aligned our definitions with the definitions that Dylan also used in the RER procedures. Um, then we have a section for the CSA 3000 um, suggested audit procedures for primary battery process performance. Um, then a agreed upon procedures engagement for downstream battery process performance. 
Um, and another agreed upon procedures engagement for the uh, transfers of battery recovery credits. And lastly, several appendices, which provide additional guidance for either producers um, and, and pros to kind of understand what the process will be for um, validating the information and then also for uh, auditors. So the purpose of the audit is to comply with the regulation. So um, you'll see here, this has been uh, snipped from the regulation directly um, that every producer shall establish a system for managing batteries and um, an audit must be undertaken. Um, the primary process of audit procedures is intended to provide guidance for producers and pros to prepare for an audit and for auditors to conduct the audit. The downstream, pro downstream and credit transfer procedures, again, is to provide guidance for pro producers and pros, um, but they also provide a specific set of procedures for auditors to conduct an audit. Um, and this is uh, dependent on the different type of audit. So as mentioned, there's a CSA 3000, which is an accounting standard, and there's a CSRS 4400, which is a separate accounting standard, which um, the different audits will follow slightly different standards. Um, again, this is taken from the regulation, so hopefully uh, you will have all seen this before. Um, and this just lays out the, the different areas that need to be reported to RPRA as part of the performance um, audit or performance reporting. And this also makes up the, um, the sections of the audit. So there's refurbishment, reuse, um, processing of batteries. Um, there is the list of products and packaging that process materials will be made into. Then there is process material that is land disposed or incinerated, uh, users full, et cetera. And lastly, it's a statement confirming whether the producer or pro acting on behalf of the producer has satisfied their management requirement. All these sections will form um, part of the audit. So we have three definitions here um, that were not included in the regulation um, that are important to define for the purposes of the performance audit procedures. Um, so collected means when a battery has been delivered to a registered battery hauler, refurbisher or processor. So rather than it uh, arrive in a collection facility or, or a place uh, bin bucket that collects batteries, it is, is when it actually is delivered to a, the hauler, refurbisher or processor. And then a downstream processor means a person that receives recoverable resources that were generated from batteries and collected in Ontario from a battery processor for the purpose of further processing. And all processing activities are considered in the scope for definition until the resources can be considered a recovered resource. So then defining recovered resource means a resource derived from batteries that will not undergo further refining and is fully used to displace virgin material in the manufacturing of a new product. So this is our first uh, consultation question. So are there any other definitions that you think need to be included in addition to collected downstream processor and recovered resource? So uh, as we give you some time to think about this, you don't have to ask right now or you can provide feedback at a later date, but we just have one question that we'd like to clarify. Uh, and it's if this procedure uh, applies to processors. Thank you for that question. Uh, so technically it is the uh, requirement of uh, producers uh, to submit an audit. So it uh, would be producers or pros operating on their behalf who would be submitting uh, this audit report. As a processor, as you'll see as we go through the presentation, there are uh, data requirements that the pros will need from, from processors in their system. And so we'd ask the processors to keep that in mind, um, but it's not the processor specifically who's going to be submitting the audit report. I don't know, Peter, is there anything that you'd like to add on onto that one? Um, no, I, or maybe slightly, yeah. The, yes, as Alan says, it's the responsibility of the producer or the pro, but... Um, they very much cannot provide the information that we would need or an auditor would need without the assistance of a, of a processor. Um, and so kind of that goes hand in hand without it actually being a, a requirement of the processor to submit the information. Uh, 
another question that relates to that question is if uh, what happens if a processor does not uh, want to participate in the audit or does not, um, I'm guessing that also means if a processor does not provide that information to a pro or to a producer? Yeah, and so that becomes an enforcement issue for us. So uh, if you read through the batteries uh, regulation, there are specific uh, requirements for processors to uh, register and report information to our PRA. Um, and there's requirements for uh, pro producers to ensure that the uh, material that they're supplying into, um, into the Ontario market is managed uh, by service providers who are following their requirements under the regulation. And so, um, you know, if, if processors, you would have to, as a producer or a pro, make sure that the processors in your collection system that you're going to be relying on to uh, meet your management requirements are compliant with requirements under the regulation. Thanks, Ellen. Uh, we don't have anything else right now, so I think we can move forward, Peter. Uh, you skipped one there, I think. Ah, thank you. Um, Okay, so this just breaks down what I sort of briefly just uh, described earlier. So there's three uh, proposed separate reports and um, the decision to separate the reports will go into greater detail. It was part of the feedback, as I mentioned earlier, and we'll go into greater detail of why, um, why we're proposing this uh, further on in the presentation. But just to give you kind of a high level, so the primary battery process, it's a CAA 3000 reasonable assurance audit. Uh, the auditor would provide an opinion. Um, we have provided uh, a list of procedures within this document. These procedures may not be applicable to um, every client that an auditor has, and there may be other procedures that an auditor may want to follow. So this is not a, a definitive list um, for the CSA 3000 portion. The uh, CSRS 4400 is agreed upon procedures. So kind of like the name suggests, um, the client and uh, the auditor agree on the procedures. And we have uh, defined a set of procedures that can be agreed upon between the two parties. Um, the auditor does not provide an opinion. They just complete the, the procedures and provide the results. Um, so this would be specifically for downstream processes who receive recoverable resources from primary processes. And it also includes a section where the primary process of performance from the 3000 report will be combined with the downstream process of performance from the agreed upon procedures report. And then lastly is um, a batteries recovery credit transfers. So for producers or pros who um, need to purchase credits to obtain their management recovery target or have recovered more resources than they need to achieve their management recovery target. They can trade credits with other pros and processes. Um, so this is again, agreed upon procedures engagement. And um, this is where the uh, auditor would perform uh, a short uh, number of procedures which we'll go into later. Um, to validate that the uh, the credit has been sold or, or purchased by a pro or producer. Next slide, please. So this slide um, is intended to um, kind of give an overview of the different conclusions that we can reach in a reasonable insurance engagement. Uh, and I'll go through these and then I'll kind of explain why this is um, why this is sort of relevant information. So um, as it goes from left to right, it's kind of like the, the best case scenario to worst case scenario. So an unmodified conclusion is sometimes would be called like a clean audit opinion. Um, that means that the subject matter say information is prepared in all material respects in accordance with applicable criteria. And that is the conclusion that the auditor reaches. A modified conclusion would be if the uh, practitioner or auditor um, is, is unable to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence, then a scope limitation exists. But the scope limitation is not so material or pervasive that um, it could result in the other two um, opinions to the right. 
Um, so this, an example of this could be if there was a, a specific processor within a pros or producer system who would not provide um, the sufficient documentation to audit evidence that an auditor requires. Um, therefore, they would, they could, we could describe what that limitation was within the auditor's opinion, and it would potentially say, so for this portion, um, we were able to provide a clean opinion, but for this subsection, uh, we were not, and this is the reason why not. Um, but as it, as it sort of clearly states there, um, this can't be so material or pervasive that it requires a modif uh, modified conclusion, uh, a disclaimer of occlusion or an adverse conclusion. So the disclaimer of a conclusion um, would be when the materiality or pervasiveness um, of the scope limitation is, is so large that um, the auditor is not able to provide an appropriate conclusion. And an adverse opinion is if, in the auditor's professional judgment, the subject matter is materially misstated. And that would be the, um, the worst possible outcome for um, the, the auditee in this case. Um, and so the reason we lay this out is because um, part of the decision to propose a secondary um, agreed upon procedures engagement for downstream processes is because if, if downstream processes were included in part of as part of the uh, agreed upon procedures engagement, there is a high potential for um, one of the three options to the right hand side to be the conclusion that is provided by the auditor. And um, we felt that an agreed upon procedures engagement might provide more insight uh, and more consistency to RPRA uh, and other users of the report, as well as um, the pros versus um, having these conclusions reached in a reasonable assurance engagement, um, where maybe we don't get the information that we need to um, improve the system overall. Next slide, please. Okay, so these are the sections of the uh, CSA 3000 audit procedure for primary uh, procedure, primary pros, primary processes. Okay, so there's suggested audit procedures for refurbished, reused, processed, non-recycled, and for confirming the satisfaction of management's requirements. And then there are the appendices that we list, and we're kind of going to go through these, um, most of these step by step. Next slide. Um, so the step-by-step -step procedures, and we're going to give an example of one of them on the next page, um, but uh, it narrows down to um, data analytics, sample testing, um, reviewing of supporting documentation between the various parties involved, um, the review of a process's mass balance, which we go into in greater detail further on, and recalculations of uh, the numbers that are reported by the pro or producer. So this is an example of um, the sp specific procedures that could be used by an auditor. Um, so this would be for processing of batteries into um, a recovered resource. So it would obtain listings, select samples, um, recalculate totals, and um, compare the recalculated weight based on the listening to the weight of processed material in the pros annual report. Um, next. Slide, please. Um, and then for each battery processor who performs processing for that pro or producer, um, these suggested procedures. Um, so selecting the samples, um, confirming accuracy and completeness, and we have an appendix for um, additional guidance on this. Um, agreeing the weights within supporting documentation, um, reviewing set samples of outbound shipments, uh, agreeing the weights of those outbound shipments, confirming the validity of those outbound shipments, confirming the validity of the end markets or downstream processes or RPM, RPMs that um, this material is sent to, um, obtaining a processing facility's mass balance, uh, reviewing that mass balance, comparing it to the reported numbers by a processor to a pro or producer, and then confirm the total weight of process material uh, allocated to the pro equals the total weight of inbound batteries allocated to the pro multiplied by the processor's process percentage 
Um, and this is part of the, the mask balance calculation determines this, which again, I'll go into further detail further on. So this is one of the appendices um, validating batteries. So there's three criteria here, it meets the definition of a battery per the regulation, was used in Ontario and is collected in Ontario in compliance with the battery regulation. Um, validating calculated weights of batteries. So actual weights and um, weight conversion factors may be used. Um, so when actual weight is used, um, there should be a scale ticket to support that weight. Uh, whenever a weight conversion factor is used, um, the auditor would need to understand that the, um, the pro or producer who's reporting the information has used the correct conversion factor for that type of battery. So auditors would be looking at uh, all available information, support and documentation for transfers between the various parties in, in the chain of material processing. Um, support and documentation could be hard copy or soft copy. Uh, if actual weight is included, is used, then it should be included along with the scale ticket. Um, ideally, support and documentation is acknowledged by both parties. So for instance, when there's a transfer of, of material or batteries from one processor from a hauler to a processor, there would be a document signed by both parties to say that we have delivered this material and the other party to say that they had received this material. Uh, it's kind of an ideal scenario. And here's some more questions. Okay, so the second question is, how does your organization record and store transactions and supporting documentation do the records and supporting documentation meet these expectations? Would this information be readily available and accessible to your auditors? So again, these questions are more so for you to think about uh, when uh, preparing for the audit report, but also we would like to hear feedback um, if you have any on this. And then in the meantime, we have um, a few questions. Uh, the first one, um, it goes back to the first question we asked, and it's it's about feedback for additional definitions. But I think since we're here, uh, Peter, we should probably clarify this. Uh, so someone's wondering what the difference between primary and downstream processor is, and then the definition of credits. Right. Um, so a primary processor receives um, batteries, uh, Ontario batteries that had not been processed or, or managed kind of in any way. A downstream processor receives recoverable resources that have been generated from batteries. So it would be material that um, has been processed at least slightly um, to the point that it's no longer a battery, um, but it is not to the point where it's a recovered resource. So it is not, for example, metal, um, but it is a kind of a, a mix of something in between a battery and a kind of recovered metal, which could be used uh, to replace virgin material in the manufacturing of a new product. And, and credits, so um, pros, well, producers have management requirements which roll up to the pro. Um, where a pro has um, managed more batteries than under their management requirement, under their so aggregated management requirement, they may want to sell that kind of excess managed material uh, as a credit to another pro or producer who has not been able to achieve their management requirement. Um, so rather than you know the, the expensive transfer of actual material to, to different processes or different pros, this is more of a, it's a credit system where you are selling kind of the, the th theoretical, well, the actual performance, but it's sold as, a, as kind of a credit, a one-time transfer. Uh, and there would be some sort of contractual relationship between the two pros or the pro and the processor producer, sorry, um, to for the sale of that credit. Thanks, Peter. Um, someone's also, this is probably targeted towards Alan, um, just wanting clarification. Um, around why is it the producer's responsibility to confirm that a pro meets their requirements? Um, 
yeah, so just to get more confirmation around that. Yeah, so uh, under uh, the regulation, under Ontario's producer responsibility framework, it is the producer who has the responsibility to ensure their materials are uh, properly managed and, and recovered. Um, under the regulation, it does allow a uh, pro to, um, to meet those requirements on their behalf, but that regulatory responsibility does rest with the producer. Um, it's part of would be part of your uh, your business contract with that pro to make sure that the pro is able to meet your regulatory requirements. Um, you also, as a producer, you're able to access information within the registry. You're able to see what um, pros are reporting on your behalf, um, and you know. So I would just make make sure that that that's an agreement that that you have in place with your pro that they're able to meet your regulatory requirements because we um you know at rpra we have to enforce the requirements as written in the regulation thanks ellen uh, someone is uh just looking for clarification on if auditors are required to register with us uh, because other jurisdictions they they require this so they're wondering if uh if rpra does as well no, um, I can I can answer that. So under the regulation, there is no uh, registration requirement for for auditors. Thank you. Uh, that's that's all we have for now. So we can move on, Peter. Um, okay. So just a brief description of another appendix uh, validating the outbound shipments. Uh, so the auditors should be looking at available. Uh, supporting documentation to validate the transfer from processor RPMs to end markets. So this would be sales invoices, uh, bills of ladings, um, and potentially payments within uh, within the purchasing or, or selling uh, parties bank account. Next slide, please. Um, and then validating the actual use of recovered resources. So. Um, in order to be looking at what the uh, RPM or end market would be using the purchase material for, um, does it align with the allowed uses within the regulation? Um, so the primary purpose of this would be ensuring that whoever purchases the process material is not then um, disposing of it, using it as fuel. Um, some of the uh, some of the uses that are not allowed to be used uh, counted as recycled under the regulation. Our next questions are what processors or controls do processor, sorry, what processes or controls do processors already have in place to validate RPMs and end markets? And do pros require this type of evidence when they contract with a processor or pay for process material? Again, these questions are for something for you to, uh, to think about. But I think we can move on, Peter. Okay, so now we go into the uh, the mass balance calculation. So um, a mass balance is a suggested method to validate the weight of recovered resources reported by a processor to a pro. Uh, you'll see this simplifies mass balance calculation at the top, uh, which kind of I'm sure a lot of you have uh, have a good understanding of what a mass balance is. Um, it's really that whatever goes in uh, must come out. Um, so we should be able to account for everything on, on both sides of the equation. And if you can account for everything on both sides of the equation, that suggests a reliability in, in the numbers that you're reporting. If they do not balance, um, that would suggest that somewhere um, uh, some of the figures that you're including are incorrect. So typically, if a processor had a mass balance and it demonstrated a recovery rate of 50%, then the processor would report 100,000 kilos of collected material to a pro, then they would report approximately 50,000 kilos of recovered resources. They have a, the mass balance suggests 50%, so they would be reporting roughly 50% to their, to their pro. 
Um, if a processor reported higher weight of recovered resources, so they 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 reported seventy thousand kilos, then in order to may want to understand how that was possible, when on average, according to the mass balance, um, they're only able to uh, recover fifty percent, and there may be reasons why um, they were able to recover a higher percentage for a specific pro, maybe the um, maybe the types of batteries that they provide to the processor. Uh, is of a, of a better quality that just generates uh, more recoverable material. Um, but this would be something that at least the auditor would want to corroborate. Um, for these procedures, the mass balance is different to the RER calculation uh, or the mass balance that is included in the RER procedures that Dylan presented um, because it doesn't take into account resources recovered by downstream processes. So it only includes the, the mass balance only includes the performance of that single processor. Next slide, please. So this portion covers uh, the opening inventory and inbound product portion for the calendar year. Um, so a processor will have had to have had an opening inventory count on January the 1st, or have previously completed an inventory count and then have sufficient records, which um, you could calculate what the inventory was at January 1st. Um, if there's anything missing here, so a type of inventory or, or a type of inbound that we're missing, then we would be uh, happy to see that feedback. Um, so this would add up everything that came in and was already at the processing facility. Next slide, please. This portion covers the products and material that's sent out by the processor. So it includes all the products that were reused, refurbished uh, and recycled. Uh, and then all the material that was not recycled, sent to landfill, incinerated, used as fuel, um, or stored, stockpiled. Um, non program material, so anything that comes in within the, the batteries that are collected, which isn't a battery, um, which obviously does have to be sent somewhere, um, but should not be counted as part of uh, the mass balance for, or part of the recovered material. Um, and then there's transfers to other processes. Um, so this may be something that happens depending on the uh, capacity of a processing facility, for example, uh, or various other reasons. They may, they may not want to process the material and they send either batteries or semi-processed material to another processor. Next slide, please. Uh, this portion covers the close of an inventory for the calendar year. So, um, again, a processor would have to complete uh, a closing inventory count on December 31st. So, I mean, this, as time goes on, obviously the opening and closing inventory of one year to the next could be the same inventory count. Um, or they'd have to have sufficient records that if they did complete a count, say, prior in the year, they would need to show the ins and outs that would confirm what the, uh, what the inventory was as at December 31st. And then this is the, the actual calculation that we use. So um, this calculation is intended to strip out all the variables and just focus on the recovered resources and the collected batteries. Um, the rest of the mass balance by balancing, as I mentioned, indicates that numbers provided by the processor can be relied upon for this calculation. Um, recycled material is only Recovered material sent to an end market to be used in making other products, as you can see by the the G minus G one minus G two. Um, there's a very there's just a very small portion of of the overall numbers that went into the mass balance. And then the available material is only recycled material, um, recycled material plus program material sent to an end market or disposed of or um, used in a manner not considered recycling. Um, so it's this, the, this simple calculation. Uh, so that's the end of kind of the, the overview of the CSA 3000 audit procedure guidance um, and open for just general questions, comments, please. Yeah, we can wait a minute or so to see if any questions come in, but we also have another uh, opportunity uh, later on where we're going to pause for questions as well. So uh, maybe we'll let you think about this and we can we can continue and then ask any questions that come up uh, in a bit.
So as I mentioned earlier, um, the proposed, uh, the audit procedures included uh, separating the primary process performance and downstream process performance, taking into account feedback that we got from uh, phase one of the consultation, uh, that it would be hard to get uh, the cooperation of downstream processes and um, they to, them to provide uh, auditable evidence. Um, so the rationale, some of the rationale for this is um, the regulation requires a reasonable insurance engagement, uh, the portion we've just described. Um, by excluding downstream processes, this reduces the likelihood of qualified or adverse opinions for the primary process of performance. And these are the opinions that I mentioned uh, a few slides ago. Um, it is expected that the agreed upon procedure report for downstream process will provide RPRA with more detailed and consistent insights into downstream processes than qualifications and adverse opinions would uh, if all performance was combined in a single CSA 3000. Um, RPRA may choose to investigate processes who report unrealistic resource recovery performance or do not provide um, sufficient evidence. Next slide, please. So the procedures are designed to provide the pro with a specific list of reports and documents they would need to request from downstream processes in the system. So because this portion uh, is a agreed upon procedures where the procedures are specified as opposed to the prior um, primary performance uh, where auditors can use the procedures we've suggested or can use other procedures. Um, because they're defined, a pro can use this and immediately start contacting downstream processes or processes can start contacting their downstream processes and using these procedures as a guide of what they would need to request when it is time for an audit. Um, it leverages the mass balance calculation uh, to calculate a downstream processes performance rate and compare to the reported weights. Um, so there's some consistency between, between the two audits. Uh, similar procedures again to, to the CSA 3000 reasonable assurance engagement. It also, as I mentioned earlier, combines the performance. Uh, so there's a there's a calculation for adding all of the performance in the 3000 report for primary processes and all of the performance in the CSA 4400 for downstream processes. Um, downstream process performance is incorporated regardless of the sufficiency and the appropriateness of the evidence. So these procedures will highlight where, um, indicate where we haven't, where an auditor has been able to complete the procedures, which would be great. It will also show where the auditors wasn't able to obtain the information they needed, but that doesn't mean that a downstream process performance will not be included or not be counted as part of the, um, the pro or producers reporting. So even if we were unable or an auditor was unable to receive no evidence from a downstream processor. The amount of material that they said they'd process would still be included, um, would still be reportable by the pro or producer. But going back to the previous slide, it would it would this would highlight an area where RPRA may want to investigate why that downstream processor wasn't able or willing to provide that information, and it also um, provides the producer and a pro or a processor. Um, the opportunity to speak to their downstream processes and understand where this sort of issue is coming from. Um, so this is an example of one of the sections within these procedures. Um, so it will look somewhat familiar if you did look in detail of the the step-by-step -step suggested procedures for the CSA 3000. Um, and it ties with uh, the mass balance. So it would be open, obtain a listing of the uh, battery inventory and recalculate those totals, obtain a listing of the open and process material inventory, semi-process material inventory, non-program material inventory. Um, if an auditor is able to obtain all of this information, um, then they would be able to essentially create that portion of the mass balance that we showed earlier. Um, and that would go some way to um, completing an entire mass balance. Next slide, please. So there's several steps like that where, the, where an auditor would be performing that mass balance, basically where 
by receiving that information from the downstream processor. Um, this section would be comparing the downstream processor's recycling rate determined through that mass balance to the imputed recycling rate determined from the inbound semi-processed material and the recovered resources reported by the downstream processor. So as I mentioned previously, if a processor, or in this case, a downstream processor is saying we received 100,000 kilos and we processed 70,000 kilos to recovered resources, but then they provide information which goes into a mass balance, which indicates that they only have a 50% recovery rate. This would indicate that there is a, a difference between the two, which is something that would want to be investigated. Um, so the, the, the last step here, E, would be calculate the difference between the two rates. So a large difference indicates that perhaps the information provided by the downstream processor is, is not accurate. Um, and then the last procedure in, in this section for downstream performance is the combining, as I've mentioned a couple of times. Um, so it'd be taking the reported weight in a pro's CSA 3000 performance report uh, and combining it with uh, all the numbers for the downstream processes um, within this report. So this would be the then result in the entire performance for a pro or producer. Uh, and, and the combination of these numbers should match the, the amount that the producer or the pro is reporting to RPRA. Thanks, Peter. So the next three questions we have are, do you agree or disagree with the approach of separating primary and downstream processor verification? Uh, if so, why? Uh, if you can provide an explanation that would help us uh, understand your feedback better. If you disagree, what do you think would be a more effective approach? Uh, since providing feedback in the initial consultation, do you think downstream processors are more or less likely to provide sufficient evidence. And this kind of leads us to a question we, we already have, Peter. So uh, if one or more downstream processors do not provide um, one of their uh, procedures, is the auditor for a primary processor expected to issue a modified opinion in its um, CSAE 3000 report? Um no and, and that's the basically the primary reason why we have where we've made this proposal um so uh for the for the primary processor csa 3000 report it's just looking at the primary processes and it's ignoring the downstream processes for that for that portion um so anything that's the result of what happens with downstream processes um is not taken into account for the primary performance um so the idea there is to increase the likelihood that there will be um, unmodified opinions, no scope limitations on those reports for the primary processes. And um, the CSA, CSRS 4400 reports, the agreed upon procedures, that's where we're going to find issues of um, missing evidence uh, from the downstream process potentially. Thanks, Peter. Uh, I think we can move forward and then um, if we get any questions, we can ask them again when we, we pause again for questions. Yeah, that's, I'll, I was just gonna add um, there, I think there is one that's more specific to an individual uh, company's case and we'll have a, one of our compliance officer or senior compliance officers on the line. will be able to, um, uh, address address this or or uh, give you some guidance on where you can contact us for uh, specific information relevant to you. There is one question that maybe I'll answer. So our auditors expected to observe year end physical inventory counts to obtain sufficient audit comfort on the inventory balances of a primary or downstream processor. So. Um, as a point that I've sort of tried to make a couple of times. So for the primary um, primary performance, um, because it's a CSA 3000 reasonable assurance engagement, um, we have 
suggested these procedures, um, but it is completely up to the, the auditor who performs your specific audit to determine whether they would need to uh, observe that inventory count. For the uh, agreed upon procedures portion that we just went through for downstream processes, we have not um, we have not said that they would need to observe that. Um, the downstream process would report those numbers. And that is part of the, you know, the reason for the mass balance is um, that everything has to balance. So if the count is correct, uh, and then all the ins and outs are also correct, and then the final count is correct, everything will balance. Um, if, uh, if say, a, a downstream process has made up their count um, and they didn't really count the information, then likely the mass balance would count the product. Likely the mass balance wouldn't balance, and that would be what would what would show an auditor, okay, um, the information received is not accurate. Okay, so uh, and then moving on to the the um, the last section. So this would only be relevant for pros or producers who have over uh, managed based compared to the obligation or under managed compared to the obligation and they want to buy or sell um, credits in order to meet their annual resource recovery obligations. Um, so this, this procedure outlines how um, in order to validate credit transfer between the pros or producers. Um, so the suggestion is that although these resource recovery performance audits are required every three years, in accordance with the regulation, it is suggested that a pro selling credits um, during that three year cycle would probably want to complete an audit on an annual basis um, to provide comfort to the purchasing pro that uh, the material they are processing is, is uh, would match or, or succeed through an audit. Um, so as promised, this is the shorter one. It's just uh, just five procedures here. Um, obtain copies of the sales agreement. Um, obtain confirmations from the purchasers and sellers that the information provided is correct. Obtain invoices to support them. Um, agree the total weight of credits to the amount reported on um, the pros report. Uh, so it's kind of like a net gross uh, that uh, calculation that would have to be done. Um, what is the pro's own performance or the producer's own performance before the consideration of credits, add to track the credits, um, divide the volume of process material by the volume of collected material to uh, get the recovery rate. And then as a result, determine if the calculation um, meets or exceeds the management requirement as defined in Ontario regulation. Any uh, Comments or questions on that procedure? Someone is asking how to determine the origin of the credits. Uh, perhaps if you go back one slide, please, Colleen. So, when uh, so a producer or a pro um, may wish to purchase the credits um, before or after the original selling pro has um, completed the uh, their CSA three thousand performance audit, um, the uh, the objective is that the 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 performance of the credits that are for sale is audited under the original pros audit. And it's just these short criteria that there are short uh, procedures that need to be performed um, to confirm that the sale uh, actually took place. There were credits available and those credits were appropriately applied, applied to the purchasing pros performance. Um, so this kind of removes the need for a, um, uh, for the auditor of the of the purchasing pro or the purchasing pro themselves to validate that because it has is already been validated in the selling pros CSA three thousand audit. Thank you. 
Thanks, Peter. Uh, that same person's wondering if an auditor can provide opinion on the validity of credits. So likely not. And that is, again, that's the reason why this section is carved out. Um, so they, the auditor would just be performing those five procedures that uh, were on the prior slide. Um, they wouldn't be providing an opinion on the validity of those credits. They would just be confirming that the sale or transfer of those credits took place and they were appropriately accounted for. Um, it would be down to the original pros or pro producers auditor to validate those, those credits, include those not those credits, but that performance uh, in the original CSA 3000 report for that pro or producer. Um, and then it's just down to the purchasing pros auditor to perform those five procedures to confirm that those, um, that this purchase or sale actually took place. Thank you. That's all the questions we have right now. We want to move forward. And that's that's me. So um, before we move forward to the final slides uh, with the next steps, we'll be launching a quick poll to gather your feedback on today's webinar. Uh, this gives us a good understanding of how helpful this webinar was, as well as highlight any areas that we can improve uh, for future webinars. So I will launch the poll now and we appreciate your participation. We'll just give it another 20 seconds and then I'll move over to the final few slides. Okay, thank you. Uh, next slide. Okay, so uh, if you have any feedback on the questions we raised today, or if you have any questions or additional feedback uh, in general, uh, please email it to us at consultations at rpra.ca by uh, the end of day of December 14th. Uh, this presentation, sorry, next slide. Uh, this presentation, along with the webinar recording uh, and the procedure, uh, will be posted to our website tomorrow. Uh, procedure's already posted, so you feel free to look at that now if you'd like. Um, and then those who attended this webinar, along with any additional producers and pros, will be sent the final procedure once it's posted to our website. So since we don't have any other questions, uh, I would like to thank everyone once again for joining us. Uh, we look forward to hearing your feedback and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks everyone.